Cool. All right, hi, I'm Ben Drosty. Um, some of you probably already know me, some of you don't. Um, so I'm here to talk about the development of my game, specifically the art and design aspect of it. The description did say I'm going to talk a bit about the development process, doing it by myself, and sort of what went right, what went wrong, a bit of the tools. Not really going to touch on that as part of the talk, but if you want to ask questions about that at the end, feel free. But the talk's going to be primarily about the art design. So, a bit of background for those who don't know me. I've been working in games in Brisbane for about 12 years now at a bunch of different studios around Brisbane on a variety of different titles and different genres and platforms, which has given me pretty good experience across a wide variety of different things there. Um, after Sega Studio shut down in 2013, I decided to start my own studio and do my own thing rather than work for another company and get made redundant again. So I made The Eyes of Ara um, between 2013 and 2016. Three year development, pretty much just me. Um, I had some help with the sound and music that was contracted out some of the guys, but otherwise it's a, pretty much a one man thing. So my background is as a senior 3D environment artist and level designer. So the game was kind of designed to leverage that skill set. Um, before I get into it, I'm gonna show you the gameplay trailer for it so you know a bit about what the game's actually about. So I don't know how loud this is gonna be, let's find out. Let's go down a bit. So it's a 3D adventure puzzle game, um, similar to the old Mist games in genre, but more modernized. So if you've ever played like, that's very dark, isn't it? There's not much I can do about that. Turn down the lights? Yeah, maybe. It's already up like full brightness. Wow, that's like, that's just a horrible screen, isn't it? Oh well, do your best. Attempt to look at it. So, well you can kind of get the gist of it anyway. It's a, um, it's a sort of a point and click style adventure puzzle. You have free movement to look around the screen <laughs> when you can see it. Um, and when you see an object, you can click on it to zoom in and manipulate the puzzle, finish it, then zoom back out again. But you move around the room by, say, clicking on a door and you'll teleport to the next room. So you don't actually walk around the environment, you're kind of fixed in place, which was a critical part of the design going forward. Um, not really critical to design, but that, that element changed the way I went about making the levels and building the game. So, well, we can't see anything anyway, so I guess I'll just skip out of it. <laughs> Well, there's some slides that might be a bit dark as well, so maybe we just leave it, unless people want it all. <coughs> hey, that went back to the start again. Cool. So, in terms of what I wanted to achieve with the game, um, these are kind of the, the art pillars, um, rather than the broader game pillars, is what sort of I wanted to achieve with the art and the design. So. Um, primarily, I wanted the puzzles to be immediately identifiable. So I didn't want the, I wanted the challenge of the game to be solving the puzzles, not finding them. So I wanted that when you walk into a room, you can immediately identify where the puzzles are going to be and then go focus on them. I wanted to maintain a sense of exploration. So I enjoy exploring things myself. I enjoy games that allow you to explore things. But because I decided to do the fixed camera positions and movement, um, that would have immediately seemed like it would limit the amount of exploration you could do. So I wanted to figure out a way to design elements into the game to still encourage some form of exploration. And lastly, I wanted to focus on environmental storytelling. So I'm not a writer, and I'm not a character artist or an actor or anything, so I wanted to leverage my skill set for this game, which was environment art. So I wanted to tell the story also through the environments themselves. So this talk is kind of how I did these three things. Um, now the first thing I wanted to say, um, yes, how to incorporate art design techniques into level design in order to um, achieve these goals. So the first thing is big AAA games do this really, really well. You just need to look at like the Naughty Dog games or the new Tomb Raider one also really well. They, they leverage their art design exceptionally well to direct the player through the environment and convey the necessary information to the player without the need for really 
intrusive HUD elements or obvious signposting. Um, but the thing to know about it is it's not a content problem, it's a design problem. So it's not about having a massive art team or an art director or a massive budget. It's simply about knowing how to use these techniques. So in terms of indie studios, it's either your artists working with your designers or your designer and artist being the same person and knowing these rules and how to incorporate them. So using it in my game, um, one of the big challenges I had, okay, dark. Um, one of the big challenges I had going into this was that my environments were going to be very cluttered and very um, full of crap, basically. It's meant to be an old abandoned castle um, full of junk from centuries of just clutter piling up. So I had a big problem, well, assumed I'd have a problem where people come to the room and just get lost among the clutter and not know where their focus needs to be. So the question became, how do I design the environment so that the player always knows where they should be looking. Again, like I said earlier, the challenge should be solving the puzzle, not finding it. On the other hand, there's a lot of hidden secrets and stuff in the game. They can be hidden among the clutter, that's fine, but for the major puzzles, for the main um, progression of the game, the critical path, I wanted that to be very obvious. So, yeah. How do I draw the attention to where it needs to be? So what I'm going to talk about now is the art basically our principles that went into designing this. Um, if you are an artist, you probably already know most of these things. Um, perhaps you need a refresher, or if you're a designer, then it's a good thing to take these into account as you're designing levels. So rule of thirds. This is a very basic rule, used a lot in photography and painting, and it's about composing the scene in a way that is aesthetically pleasing to the eye. Um, so if you imagine the screen sort of divided into third lines like that, Generally, the rule is if you try to position your major elements along those lines or at the intersection of them, um, it helps to create an aesthetically pleasing shot. So you usually have your horizon, say, at one of those lines, or you have your major subjects at the intersection. So in the case of this one, we've got the two things you can't see. The two major puzzles are roughly positioned in those shots. Now, this has two effects. One, it just looks pretty. Um, because I have the fixed camera, this is essentially what you see when you load into this section. Um, so it looks nice to start with, um, but it also helps the player to immediately identify what the two major um, subjects of that scene are, because they're kind of nicely composed in that spot. And look, black screen. Um, so when I went to design the levels uh, in the grey box stage, I would try to... There's no brightness on this, is there? No. Um, I tried to lay out the room so that as you panned around the room with this fixed camera, things would kind of naturally line up in these sections, so no matter where you looked around the room, let's see if this works, there's a cupboard there and a chest there. Da, da, da. Yeah, sort of. Um, as you pan around the room, things kind of fall roughly in these sections. Um, this kind of had two, I mean, one, it means that almost no matter where you're looking in the room, the shot is going to look pretty. Um, uh, it's gonna help you identify sort of where the puzzles are, as I said earlier, but also it helped me to kind of space things out evenly around the room. So I never had a situation where I felt like all the puzzles were all sort of clustered on one side of the room, but because thinking of this from the grey box stage right at the start, you know, it helped space it out. Um, sight lines, wow. Maybe I just could like, crank the brightness up next time. Um, yeah, play with that. So sight lines are kind of like natural lines created by the environment up. Um, and their purpose is to draw your eye to certain places. So in this case, can't see it, but there is like the carpet runs along the floor. You've got uh, the directionality of the boards on the roof run down there in the corridor and the skirting boards on the wall all sort of point towards a door. Just imagine what I'm describing. A door at the end of the hallway, um, which is sort of the main uh, room of the game. In addition to that, there's these two corridors. Well, there's one corridor off the left and the sort of the objective door to the right there. Um, with these skirting board lines sort of pointing off that way, which sort of suggests to the player that they can also rotate to the side. Um, in practice, this does actually work. Um, in the case of this, with the camera positioned slightly more forward so you can't see those side ones, even though you can rotate the camera, because what you're seeing is this hallway pointing out directly in front of you, everyone just wanna, wants to click forward and go forward. By pulling the camera back slightly so you've got a glimpse of this sideways um, direction with the boards facing that way, um, now it's sort of half and half. Some players will click forward, some players will rotate to the left and see what's over there. 
So yeah, draw a point. And slowly direct play through the environment. Um, much better than placing signposts or something. Um, wow. This is a really hard thing. So um, I've used it also to direct the player's attention towards clues and objects in the environment because it's a puzzle game and hidden objects. I wanted to hide things sort of in the environment but also have the player find them without too much trouble, especially if it's the major puzzle. Um, so it allowed me to so subtly direct the player's view towards important features, but have them still feel like they found it themselves, which they have, but it's about a subtle nudge in the right direction. So in this case, there's two wooden planks kind of like pointing directly up at this button on the wall, which you can see anyway, because it was this is very early in the game. It's a bright white button on an otherwise dark wall, so you shouldn't miss it anyway. But as a visual aid, if you're looking at the clutter on the ground, um, the, noise, the eye is drawn up by these planks sort of pointing up at the button. Um, that's a little bit better. This is very similar to um, the sight lines. The Fibonacci spiral is generally a way of guiding the eye around an entire scene and ending on a focal point. It's a very visually pleasing effect, um, but in terms of game design, um, it can be used to let the player take in the whole scene. Um, very good if you just want to, if I suppose, impress them with an overall image, but still have them focus on where the objective is. So in this case, the eye is kind of drawn up from the left around the top of the screen to the castle and then down that thick dark side on the wall and back up into the gate, which is where they need to go. And I find this is what people actually do watching Let's Plays and stuff. Some people will get to this scene. This is sort of the default view the camera takes, roughly like this anyway. Um, and some players will actually get the camera, look to the left, and then almost follow that spiral around with the camera before they get to the gate and click on it. Or some just click on the gate because it's right there. Framing. Um, this is used to highlight important elements and also direct the player through a scene. So um, very simple, it's basically about making a frame around something important, whether it's in this case, it's a doorway, which is a very obvious frame. So it's sort of a well-lit room behind an otherwise dim and dark wall, or it may not be a doorway, it may be simply just sort of the natural shape of the environment, maybe some collapsed pillars or something sort of creates an obvious um, contrast between the subject in the frame and some less interesting thing around it forming the frame. Very good way to draw the player's attention to something and create an obvious path. Again, better than sort of signposting or putting an objective marker. Think of how you can do it visually to make them want to go investigate down there. Separating surfaces. Um, it's amazing how many games get this wrong. Um, it's really simple. Um, what you want to do is use different color tones and different colors, colors and tones, to separate the floor, the ceiling, and the walls. Um, the main reason you do this, first of all, it is sort of aesthetically pleasing. Um, it, it, it creates a nicer image. Um, it's easier to read with the eye, but it also allows the player to navigate the scene a lot easier as well, as they can get a better sense of the space of where their barriers are. So in this case, there's, um, you can see, well, they can see the image better now with the floor and the ceiling there. So you immediately know where the walls are, where the floor is, where the roof is, and you can kind of immediately assess the scene without having to squint. Um, also important in 2D games, separating the foreground from the background, so you know where your actual play space is. I've seen some 2D games, none that I've worked on, I'll just put that out there right now, because um, I know people in the room I've worked on in 2D games um, that have had this problem, uh, at least not while I came on board. But yeah, also creates a uh, path very well. So in this case, you can kind of see um, where the player needs to go very clearly um, without any for signposts or anything um, because you've got the yellow, orangey brick and rock and the nice green path in the middle leading up from the docks. Lighting, speaking of. So um, I'm sure you've all seen very obvious examples of lighting in games where they use like a spotlight to shine a light on something obvious. That's the most obvious use for it. Um, the thing to remember about lighting is the eye is drawn to areas of contrast. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, look, I can put the slides up online anyway, so it'll be fine. Hey, that's better. Maybe I should go back a few. I'm just gonna scoop back very quickly through what I was showing. I will not repeat everything I said, um, but okay. So, there's your rule of thirds, objects on the major lines. Hey. Don't do that. Oh, whatever. Well, you can kind of see it sort of um, was the idea is things would sort of fall naturally in these lines as you go around this, as the room. 
It doesn't always happen in practice, but it was a good way to lay out the room from the start. Um, there's your sight lines. It doesn't, yeah. So you can see where the skirting board and the carpet and the roof all kind of point towards there, and those lines off to the side, sort of suggesting you can look to the left as well. Um, those two boards pointing up at that button. Again, this is very early in the game, this room, um, so it was meant to be obvious already, but that sort of helps if you're scanning the bottom of the, of the room. Um, there's your spiral leading up around there. The framing, separating surfaces. Lighting. Okay, so the eye is drawn to areas of contrast now that we can see some. Um, so you'll naturally want to look at the areas that are well lit as opposed to the flat or potentially darker areas as well. So you can use the spotlighting technique to basically highlight an important element. That's a very obvious technique. Um, it can work. Sometimes it looks like the designer has placed a lamp there shining on this thing. Um, I've seen some examples in some of the Bioshock games that do that. And it looks nice, but it looks so contrived in my, my opinion. Um, Maybe a bit like that. Um, but using these flatter light lit areas, it allows the eye to kind of just pass over it because it's not that interesting and focus on where the contrast is. Um, and the light rays themselves can also create sight lines to help draw your eye to specific locations. So in this scene, you've got, there's a clue on the box there lit by the gap in the window and the thing there. Um, come to think of it, also with the, um, I'll go back to that spiral one. This one was done in a similar way where the, um, the lighting was designed to fall on the gate there and create a shadow all around it. So the cliff that goes around behind you, there's a kind of divot in the mesh to allow the sunlight through to illuminate just the gate and not the rest of it. So it's something you have to think about um, as you're designing the level, which is the point of the next slide, I believe. Oh no, next one. Um, so in this case, you can also be used to draw attention to where your objective is and guide the player through a level. So in this case, there's the light coming from behind that sort of gap in the wall there, which creates a nice sort of square um, portal to look through and draws your attention to there. That one over there, not so good. It illuminates the area next to the stairs rather than the stairs themselves. So I get a lot of people clicking on the light and that desk. They want to focus on that and there's nothing there where it should be the stairs itself are illuminated. Um, so good example and a bad example. <coughs> so. The key thing to remember about this sort of thing is that lighting is a part of level design in this respect. So you need to position your major light sources during your early design stage, or at least have some idea of how it's going to fall out, which is kind of what I was saying about the light on the gate there. That was sort of planned out when I was designing that section of the level. I said, okay, the sun's coming from this direction. How can I position these elements so that the gate is in, is in direct sunlight and everything else is darker? Um, and so this is this room. The, obviously the main center light and the light by the door was positioned from the start, along with a couple other important ones, and then sort of built up around that. Extra stuff added wherever. Color, much the same as lighting. Um, the eye will be drawn to contrast. So brighter, uh, more contrasting colors will draw the eye away from desaturated, darker tones, uh, dimmer tones. So I've used in this room, this is the final room of the tutorial. Uh, most of the background is just that sort of flat, flat grey, even the barrels there, the red and yellow barrels there are more desaturated um, tones so that the eye is immediately drawn to a big blue generator with the big red button in the middle. Um, the little red yellow can down there probably shouldn't be there because it really attracts your attention. You can see what I'm talking about, um, but it does nothing. So arguably that shouldn't be there because it's drawing your attention to the wrong spot. But, you know, maybe it's a red herring. It is a puzzle game, so it's not too bad. So yeah, the important element should pop out of the scene. In this case, it's very obvious sort of what you need to click on, which is the big red button there in the middle of the generator. So it's been used um, for other elements in my level design as well. So the green door there is a um, sort of the objective of this room. You need to sort of get through that. So it can be used to define important elements and separate them from other ones. So most of the rooms in this area are all just the plain wooden brown, plain brown wood. Um, but this one is green, which sets it apart from the rest, immediately making it seem more important. Um, but more importantly, it's used as a navigational aid in the following room, which was very important given my teleportation movement system. A lot of people would move from this room to the next one, um, and they would immediately get lost as to what direction they were facing. 
few reasons for this. Um, because you have less connection between them, um, this room in particular is essentially a T intersection, uh, cross intersection. So you've got four doors, and most players get in the room and don't know which way they've come from. Uh, this is not the direction you're looking when you enter. This is to show the door, but you're facing. You're always facing away from it. So I would have thought that would be enough, but people would still would always get lost. So by making that door green. Um, it immediately gave people a navigational aid, so they'd turn around and go, okay, where did I come from? Oh, green door, I came from there. I'll go left, or whatever. Um, so I was getting a lot of feedback about this room early on, saying, I'm getting lost, I can't tell where I'm going. Made that door green, that feedback stopped. So, very simple change, solved a very annoying problem. So, using objects. Um, using objects correctly can help the player identify important features and sort of connect the level together. Um, in particular, it creates yeah, connection between point of interest, which aids the player in building a kind of mental map of the level. So, in this case, I've got these wires on the ground, which is a very obvious way of doing it. It's just having wires connecting stuff is a very good way of just saying this is connected to that. Um, games like uh, Half-Life 2 do it a lot, where you see like a, a block gate and a button that opens it. They're almost always connected by some kind of power cable strung along the level, so you can just sort of trace it back to where it needs to come from. It's a way of helping you, you know, not only figure out what's connected to what, but figuring out how to get to places. In this case, there's four buttons you need to activate to activate that door. This is sort of the finished picture of it, so those lights are all on now, but it starts off. And there's four buttons in four rooms. You can't see the fourth cable. It's below the camera. And they're sort of connected to each room by that. So it gives you a clue that, okay, to solve this puzzle, I need to enter the rooms. And then the object itself, the art treatment used for that, matches the art treatment used for the button you need to press in each room. So when you do press it, there's no confusion over that that is related to that, because it's the same aesthetical design. Aids and from whatever level. Particularly important in my game, given it's a puzzle game, I had a lot of times in rooms where there's the puzzles are either not self-contained to one object, because not what happens, as I said earlier, when you click on something in my game, the camera will zoom in on it. So if you clicked on that thing on the table there, the camera would zoom there and you'd be locked there. You can't rotate the camera once you're in there, you're just manipulating the puzzle. And then you zoom back out and click on something else. But oftentimes the puzzle is not self-contained like that. You have to use multiple things around the room. So using cables and stuff like this was a good way of connecting up various puzzles. And in particular in rooms such as this one, which you can't see um, behind us, but behind the camera there is another set of puzzles which aren't connected to this one. So by using this, I could define this set is connected, this set is connected to itself, so don't, don't try and interact between them, essentially. So people aren't feeling on one thing, expecting changes on this, and getting wildly confused. It helps clarify um, what they need to be focused on. Movement. Um, movement catches your attention. Um, the eye is drawn to movement, essentially, especially in predominantly static scenes. So it's a really great way of drawing attention to a specific part of the level um, and possibly directing a player to that position. In this case, there's this little blue orb that flies around the room and its sole purpose in this room is to draw your attention to these things on top of the pillars here, um, which I'll get into a bit more in a little bit. Depth of field. So this is a post effect. Um, and on depth of field, you often see it in photography, it's when, if you don't know, it's when your subject may be in focus and your background is out of focus. And your focal length is the rate at which it goes to out of focus, essentially. So the point of it is to isolate the subject and be distinct from the rest of the scene. Now, depth of field in my game is adaptive in that it's sort of the focal length or the range is based on the focal point's distance from the camera. So if you're looking at something further away, the field of view pulls out, so more of the scene is in focus. And if you're looking at something close up, it pushes in. So what you're looking at is in focus, and then it blurs out very quickly. Um, and because my game is a sort of a click around the screen game, as you click around, so if you just drag the camera and look around, it'll ray cast out from the camera and point at whatever's in the center. But if you click around the scene, it'll update the focal point to wherever you click. So Theoretically, wherever the player's attention is, because either they're looking or they're just clicking, wherever their attention is, is what will be in focus. This also means that when you zoom in on a puzzle, because it's in so close, that the puzzle itself becomes into focus and the rest of it goes out of focus. Um, also very useful in my game, given that 
I was going for a very minimalist interface. Um, the only UI you have is down the bottom of the screen um, is the inventory. It's hidden at the moment. You can actually press the button on top and it slides it down off screen. All you get is that little half moon shape down there. But that's the only UI there is. Um, so to exit out of a puzzle, you either scroll with the mouse wheel or you click off the puzzle somewhere in like the background space. So by having this depth of field, it helps to define what is the subject you're looking at, what's the puzzle and what's not. So it's easier to click off what you need to click off to zoom back out again by having that distinction. So breaking the rules. Um, these rules help me to design the levels in such a way as to ease the player and direct them through the game. Um, as I did that, I started to learn where I could break them and invert them to make things more difficult. So one rule that's interesting that I haven't touched on yet is the player never looks up. This is true for all games, any genre pretty much. If you position anything above the top half, well, the top half or above on the screen, chances are the player won't see it. Um, you want to place all your major elements either in the middle or below. Most players, when they get into my game, when they get into a new scene, they either pan to the side or they go down here and do this. And they look directly at the ground. No one ever looks up. So that's true of all games. If you're going to position something, position it in the middle of the screen or below. Or be prepared to do a lot of work to draw the attention up to the top of the screen using the techniques I've just been talking about, obviously. Um, so in this case, this is where I was talking about the movement earlier, these things up the top here were not being noticed. People would walk into this room, it's the, the primary puzzle of this room is to solve these four pillars around the top of the room here. People would enter the room and spend minutes searching around the room and having no clue what to do because they simply wouldn't see these things because they're, they're not even off the screen, they're on the screen, but no one notices them because they're too close to the top. Um, so. To solve the puzzle, I didn't want to redesign the whole thing, so I just I added the light, and all it does is just fly around the top of the screen from puzzle to puzzle. Works in a number of ways. One, it's a bright blue contrasting object, very clearly draws attention. Two, it moves, so that even if you're spinning the camera around pretty fast um, and just sort of ignoring the contrast, you'll catch a glimpse of the movement and you'll look up at it. And it's also got a spotlight, so when it stops on one, it shines a spotlight on the puzzle and moves on to the next one. So. Once I put that in there, no more troubles. Everybody notices it all of a sudden. But um, knowing this, I was then able to invert that for some of the more difficult puzzles. So as I said, the main sequence of puzzles, I didn't want it to be a challenge to find them. But there's a whole bunch of hidden secrets and bonus puzzles, which I was fine with. So in this case, you enter this room, your primary puzzle is that box on the table there, which some people find really difficult. Um, but if you look up at the roof, there's this gigantic puzzle directly on the roof above you, and it's surprising how many people don't see that and other ones like that. Just because it's, it's above them and they don't think to look up. There's a few puzzles like that, and there's also some of the hidden collectibles I hide on like the top shelf or something. So it's sort of up further on the screen, so you're not generally looking up there at them. Negative space was used, not very often, probably this one. Um, in this room, the light and the sound, this is sort of glowing yellow orb that you have to find in the game. There's several of them. Um, they have a bright yellow glow and they have this sort of hum they make. So when you enter the room, you get a sense of the light sort of coming from behind the cupboard there and you get this hum. Um, and I've used kind of some of the other techniques I've talked about like framing and, the direct and sight lines to sort of point towards this negative space in the gap there. And the idea is if you click on the gap, then you're taken to the object. So it's a bit more hidden than it being behind something or inside something. It's um, about identifying you know, what's odd about the room and then searching that. Misdirection was a big thing. Um, because my camera is fixed in one position and I wanted to have a lot of hidden objects around the room, um, the hidden collectibles are all optional stuff for people who just want more content um, for completionists. But because you're fixed in one location, um, I didn't mean, I mean, I couldn't hide anything like under a table or behind something because you can't walk around to look at it. Everything needs to be visible from the camera's position, which potentially makes things really easy. So I've used a lot of these art techniques to try and rather than draw your eye to things, but to draw your eye away from things. So in this case, I've used the sight lines and kind of the framing of the door there to either draw your attention to that hallway, which is the exit to the previous level, 
or the um, directionality of the banisters there to sort of pull your eye left or right. Um, the idea being is that you kind of miss the little uh, panel there half hidden behind the vase. So it's, it's, it can be seen, it's, it's actually quite large in game um, and you see a good half of it. But because your eye is kind of drawn to that light and left and right above that, you tend not to notice it at a quick scan. You kind of actually have to go hunting for it. Another example of that, this time using the light, um, using the essentially spotlighting from the window there to draw your attention to that thing on the desk. Um, but the important thing, what I'm about to mention now, is that this is about misdirection. It's not about making things invisible. I have to be very careful in the game that when I'm hiding things using the lighting, that I don't make the thing that's hidden just impossible to see because it's dark. It's about directing the player to the wrong location, not about making what they're trying to find invisible. So in this case, it's done sort of in two ways. One, there's a light on the table, so it draws your attention up. And two, there's a very obvious box on top of the table with a pickup in it. And so you don't expect there to be another one directly below it with another pickup. So it's kind of a, you know, a misdirection using another pickup as well. So environmental storytelling is that third pillar. Um, as I said, I'm not a writer or an actor or a character artist, so I wanted to tell my story using my skill set, which is environment art. So it became a question of what techniques do I use to try and convey that? Um, this could very easily be a whole talk on its own. So it's, not, it's going to be rushing through a little bit quickly, um, but it should give you an idea of what I was trying to achieve with this. So in case you haven't heard of this before or you don't know what it is, my definition, I suppose, would be it's the art of telling a story through the sound and visual elements of an environment itself um, rather than through written or spoken content. So it can be used very explicitly in the case of, say, Kyla Porps in front of a, a gun. It tells a very clear story of something has happened here. Someone shot the guys and they died or whatever. Um, it can be used more implicitly, so thinking about what does a room say about someone, about the way they lived, about how they sort of kept their room. Is it dirty? Is it tidy? Is it, is it all organized by you know, color and size or whatever, or is it eclectic or whatever? Um, and I found it in this one a very powerful tool for conveying themes and ideas. And I started thinking more of environmental storytelling in terms of text versus subtext. So I thought of text as the actual written content and the explicit um, content of the game, and the environment art as more subtext to support that. So this is done through environment dressing. So in the case of this room in particular, this is near the end of the game. You can see the dirty dishes there and sort of the makeshift bed with the journal on it. It's designed to say something about the person who lived there. So this is near the end of the game. Um, and it, and the idea is the owner of the castle has been sleeping up in this room rather than in his own bed. And that's kind of supported by the content in the journal, which speaks about him spending more time up here and finding more comfort in this room, um, but doesn't explicitly say, I have been sleeping here and not maintaining the rest of the house. That should be apparent because the rest of the house is not maintained and he's got a bed here. So it's, it's like, you know, you probably learned it, you know, show, don't tell, back when you're doing like writing in high school. It's um, very, you know, easy technique. In terms of text versus subtext, I tried to convey a lot of depth and meaning um, through the art in more subtle ways as well. So it's used to yeah, reinforce the themes of the game and the stories through subtle visual clues. So in the case of Ozavara, one example is all the paintings in the game were chosen specifically for one reason or another. Sometimes it's just because it's a design that the puzzle called for. Um, but if it's just sort of a background element, um, it's generally chosen explicitly to reflect the themes or the wider themes of the game. In this case, um, pictures of ships and the ocean are very prominent throughout the game. And it's usually prominent in areas that reflect the main character who's, who's portrayed as some kind of explorer. Um, and so in this case, this painting up there is of a sort of a storm tossed sea and shipwreck, which also kind of reflects his character arc at this stage of the game as well. So it's meant to not explicitly say something about the room like dirty dishes, but more sort of reflect the themes. Um, lighting, music and post effects. So you see this a lot often used in film as well. 
about using the lighting to set the mood and the, obviously the music. Um, in terms of post effects, we're talking about the um, color grading of the scene here as well. So each of the gavels in my game has its own um, uh, color grading palette. Um, ignoring the one on the top left, which is just the introduction. Chapter one is the halls there on the top right. Um, that's when you first enter it. It's meant to feel a bit more eerie and unsettling as you don't know what you're getting into at this stage. So it's the green tinge sort of brings that sort of set feeling of unease out. Um, if you know anything about uh, color theory, which I'm not really going into because I don't have the time or really much of the knowledge to be honest, something I need to work on, um, is about different colors can sort of inspire different emotions in people. So um, the green of that is meant to make you feel a little bit uneasy and feel a little bit, that make the room feel a little bit more mysterious. The second chapter is the halls down the bottom left there. These are called the living quarters. Um, we get more into the characters in this level. And so it's a bit warmer, a um, bit more inviting, um, but also still very kind of dark and contrasty to make you feel a little bit uneasy about it. And then the final level of the game, the laboratory, um, is this cool blue color, which in part is meant to make it feel a little bit more sterile, but also a little bit um, ethereal. It's, um, this is where we start to get into revealing the mystery of the game. And so it's more of a richer, saturated blues as well. Oh, and I have a vignette around the camera as well. And this was done explicitly to give a sort of feeling of claustrophobia as well. So you feel kind of enclosed um, by the environments as well. Now this, I wasn't able to use as much as I wanted when I originally planned it. The idea was to have that um, be uh, editable per room. So if you enter a particularly dark and gloomy room, I could bring the vignette in a lot and open up in other ones. And one idea was to, at the very end of the game, when you're sitting on the tower at the end and wide open sky, was just to remove the vignette entirely as you kind of like at that sort of revelation point of the game, the ending in full view and everything. Unfortunately, didn't have time for that, but that was the intent, was to use that post effect to help influence the player's um, emotional state at that point in the game. Now, also in terms of color, <coughs> go, do thing. There we go. Um, what I did focus on with color in this game was to associate it with characters more than um, expression of mood. The reason I did this was to help define who the characters were and define their influence on the world, which I'll get into a bit. But the general idea was to assign each character a certain color and then position them on the color wheel so that their positions on the wheel kind of reflects their disposition to one another in terms of character. It's a little bit esoteric. Um, I don't know if it really affects people, but maybe subtly it does. So the idea was that if you see um, Christopher is the owner of the castle, um, Astra is his sister, and Alexander and Clementine are her two children. Um, so the Christa and Astra are very diametrically opposed siblings, um, as was Clementine and Alexander, whereas they're quite fond of the people they're sort of lining up next to there, or they get along better with those ones. So the idea was that if you find stuff belonging to them in the game, it's colored in their color, so you can kind of identify this belongs to this person. And then if you find, say, Christopher's stuff next to Clementine's, you can say, oh, it, it complements each other. It, look, it looks right. Whereas if you have Christopher's and Astra's stuff in the same room, they're contrasting, which sort of gives that impression that they don't really belong together. So in this, this is the children's bedroom. So you can kind of see where the blue is used to represent Clementine's bed, the orange for Alexander's, and then even the painting on the wall there, I even photoshopped that with different colors. So you have the boy and the girl there, each dressed in the colors of the two children as well. Not necessary to say that those are the children, it's just an old painting, but it reinforces that notion of this color is associated with this character. Um, and the idea was that it would help, yeah, create it, help to tell the story by creating a connection between areas with the different characters. So if you go somewhere that is predominantly green, you kind of get the impression this is important to this character. If it's blue, it's important to this character. This is Astra's bedroom, the red bed, the red lighting. There's a, she's a painter and an artist as well, so there's like an easel behind the, the camera there with a, sort of a red paint box and stuff. Um, also touching again on the paintings on the walls here, another example of using that sort of subtext to tell the themes. Um, the subjects of the paintings in this room also kind of reflect her character's emotional state at this point in the game and what she's feeling in her character arc. But I also picked ones that had a distinct red element 
to the painting. So they're connected to her along with reflecting her emotional mood. Christopher's room, so green carpet, green bed, bluish green couch there. And all his journals around the castle are all you know, green colored as well. Uh, this is a rocket ship off a toy box belonging to Clementine. So it's blue is her color. So she gets a blue rocket ship and the music box itself is blue. So another example is right at the beginning of the game, you get a set of keys to the back gate of the castle. They have a little tag on them saying black back gate and they're, they're green. Meant to imply that these were Christopher's spare keys. So just summing up what I've been saying. So visually pleasing scene composition can also inform the gameplay. This is my way of saying that the graphics versus gameplay debate is kind of a null subject, I feel. It's not one or the other. It's both can inform the other and make a better experience, and indeed they should. So it can be used to subtly direct the player through an environment without the need for really intrusive GUI elements or signposting. Um, you look at a lot of games, open world games do it, not so bad because they're open world, but where they have like a marker on the map it basically floats on the camera and you just follow it. So you're not really exploring at that point, just going go to wherever that marker is. Uh, I remember the Fable games, I think, had like this glowing breadcrumb trail through the levels, which I found really annoying. I, why can't I just like explore? Why, why, why give me this path? Or maybe even a literal signpost in the level, which is not so bad. They, they thematically at least fit. Um, or really obnoxious, I've seen like a floating arrow above the character pointing the right direction. I think it's just appalling. So much better solution is to use the environment art itself to actually direct the player where you want them to go and do that. Have a look at the Tomb Raider games or the Naughty God games. They do it really well. They show the player exactly where you should be going through the art itself without the need for stupid signposts. Um, artists and level designers should work on this during the gray box stage. Simple as that. Um, if you're thinking about this stuff from the start, then you can design it into your level. You can design your scene composition to both look nice and inform the gameplay. Environmental storytelling. Environmental storytelling, as I think, is the game's subtext to the game's text. To the written and spoken content is the text, and the environmental storytelling is the subtext. So it's a way, think about what the environment says about the person who lived there. Think about what it says about their character, and what it says, crucially also, to the player about them. Use object placement to tell explicit stories. Um, if you need to say something direct, um, use the art design to reinforce the themes. Not necessarily... <coughs> literal art like paintings like I've done but also things about the sort of shapes you're using if they're curvy or spiky or you know, threatening looking or um, different sorts of colors association or objects that might mean something contextually in one way to some player to some uh, character and use the lighting and the music to set the emotional tone of the level um, and that is all I've got to say on that so if you want to contact me there are my contact details um, if you've got any questions about this, or if you've got any questions about the project in general, as I said, I wasn't going to focus on that in the talk itself, but I'm happy to take questions on the project as well. Um, we're here for quite a while yet, so if you have questions, please ask. Or, no, oh, okay, right. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. when to draw the player's eye to something and when to uh, kind of hide it from them a little bit to, to make the puzzle more difficult. Like, how do you decide about that? Is it all through um, actually getting playtesters to play it? Um, yes, playtesting definitely comes into it. Um, like I said at the beginning, <coughs> um, sorry, let's get some water. I'm talking for too long now. As I said at the beginning, I wanted the challenge to be solving the puzzles, not finding them. So in general, the major element is not hard to find, and I want to draw attention to that. If it's a clue, that's sort of the question there, is how difficult do I make it? How much do I draw your attention to it? If it's a clue for the critical path, I generally put more effort into drawing your attention to it. If it's just a hidden secret, I generally, well, usually I try to draw attention away from it in that case. 
And really it comes down to play testing. It's like, you can kind of look at a scene and go, okay, how obvious is that to me, to my eye? I already know where it is, but how much does it stand out? Um, okay, that's pretty good, play test that. And if people keep missing it and getting frustrated, then all right, I need to do something better. I need to put a light on it, I need to make it larger, whatever. But yeah, I think it really comes down to play testing um, and knowing how much you want them to find it. Is it meant to be hidden or is it meant to be fairly obvious? Is there ever been a case where something was meant to be fairly hidden and then it's found too easily? Because it seems like you've had cases with the opposite. Um, yes, yes, actually, occasionally. Um, generally, it's some of the hidden pickups have been found easier than I expected, um, including some of the more difficult puzzles as well were also found more easily. Um, which was a little bit disappointing because I was hoping those ones would take longer to solve, but some people just like picked up on them really quickly. Mm -hmm. I'm actually surprised how many people found that thing on the roof I showed earlier. Um, a lot of people still miss it, which is great. Um, but actually a lot more people find it than I thought would. But the good thing is when they do find it, if I'm watching like a Let's Play or something, they're always excited when they find it because they don't expect it to be there. And so they feel, they feel good about themselves. Ooh. Yeah. So yeah. Sorry? So it seems like um, do you do a lot of research around, I guess, psychology and, and so on? Because it seems like you touch on a lot of elements that, like just tell smalls of grouping and object permanence and all these other things that give you that sort of playbook, or did you just basically trial and error as you went through? Um, did not research any kind of psychology. I did research um, art design, though, and in, especially in terms of um, film production as well and framing shots for film. Because my game is... I guess it's more applicable to film um, than most because it's the static camera. Um, it's more, more applicable to like a shot in a film. So it's like, how does a film compose a shot to be, to draw attention or, um, or say something? Okay, well, if they're doing that, then I can do a similar thing because I teleport to an area and show a shot, essentially. So I can do, you know, apply those rules. But they're also um, artistic design principles. So um, many art students will learn these techniques as part of art already. It's just a matter of adapting them and seeing how they affect the gameplay as well. So basically, I mean, once you sort of settle on the aesthetics and the design and, and I guess the, the puzzle, was it, did you find yourself having a contract concept with the user and that you were sort of somehow eventually perfect that pattern of the contract? So things like you had, I noticed, where the doors had the blue sort of and once you sort of set that contract up, do you feel like you have to keep maintaining that? Or do you find ways to sort of... Because you mentioned about misdirection, and that would be like one of those cases where you say, that door typically means you can go down the path, mm. but in this case I'm going to play a trick on you and prank you. Yeah, so... A bit, yeah. There's certain rules, and this goes for all games, that once you sort of start to establish rules, um, you don't generally want to break them or the player gets frustrated. Um, if you establish that, um, you know, red barrels explode or whatever, and then suddenly you come across red barrels that don't explode, the player gets confused and wonders why, sort of thing. So it's, it's similar in my game. A lot of my puzzles are unique, but a lot of them do reuse similar um, uh, interactive elements, just for efficiency as well. So I try, generally try and have things work the same way, but the, punk, the puzzle itself may function differently or may have a twist to it, which I feel is, is still fair in that it doesn't break expectation, but it does um, subvert it a little bit sometimes. Yeah. Uh, with, the, with the use of uh, sunlight in a few places, like the, the one illuminating the gate and the, the light rays coming through the windows, um, how, um, how, how much did you make, like, cheat that versus use the <laughs> since sunlight lamp, sunlight? And sunlight. Um, so the sunlight in the outdoor section is one sunlight. So that one was actually more difficult because I couldn't change it per room. Whereas almost every single room in the game, I think I started with it like all coming roughly the same direction, and then as I tweaked them, they all got like shifted around a bit. So I mean that second level in the bedrooms there, there's about four bedrooms along the side of the castle, all theoretically have the light coming in the same direction through the windows. They're all slightly different to like line up where I need it to, but all roughly that angle. The thing that annoys me the most is that I went to a lot of effort to make sure that the exact date that the game is set on 
matches the night sky at that point in the world at that date. Because there's a, the end of the game is at night and you can see the stars. And there's a telescope in the game. If you look through the telescope and type in the coordinates, you get the actual view of the sky that you would see if you went to a real telescope. But the sun goes the wrong direction around the sky over the progress of the game. So that annoys, because it doesn't actually move in game, but in the first level, it's like sort of in the, the south, and then it kind of like, it, it sets in the east. It sort of goes that way and sets, rather than, because the, wall, the rooms are on the, the, west, the east side of the castle, not the west. Um, I didn't think about that early on when I first designed the castle, um, that I would need to set this, you know. That just pisses me off, <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> It's like, my night sky is accurate, my sun sets the wrong direction. Uh, have you uh, thought about like players that get stuck on a puzzle, like have a timer or something, so that you know, more food pop up as they like, uh, are stuck on the same puzzle for five or six hours? I was the man. <laughs> Hopefully they won't. Um, I was going to implement a hint system, so that you may maybe right click or something on a, or maybe click a button and it gives you a hint. Um, just didn't have time to implement that. Essentially, that would have required a lot of work to actually figure out where the player is in the game and figure out the right sort of hint to give and I you know, already had enough on my list of things to do at that point. Um, I, one of the reasons I added in all the hidden pickups, often they're not just hidden, but they're actually behind their own little puzzles. Um, and the level isn't strictly linear either. There's often times where you can split off and go do different parts of the main critical path and then come back, like it basically branches and comes back together. So if you do get stuck on one puzzle, um, you can always just leave it for a while, go off and do something else. So you never, sh theoretically, there should be few, few incidents where you're at one point in the game and there's nothing else to do and you're just stuck. You should always be able to take a break and do something else for a while and come back. Um, and there are guides online. At this point, I just direct people to that. I'll give them the answer if they ask. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, it's just going back to a little bit about the bit you said about looking up. Uh, was that the case that prior to, prior to getting that point, you had already given that little hint of the light up high and that coaxed people into, oh, there's a possibility of looking up, or was that independent of that? Um, I put that puzzle up there after learning that I couldn't just place things above the player. So that room I showed with the light, um, that was part of an early demo I built to show some other um, friends. Um, and they all got stuck, because that was what I was saying, they couldn't find the things up the top of the screen. Um, so I added the light in. It was after I realized that, I was like, hang on, well, if that's the case, then I can start placing things on the roof, and then, you know, and then that's a great way of hiding things. So I went back and, like, added that one in. Yeah. Oh, but that, uh, in terms of progress, that's actually set before that one. So the, the light thing is in, like, the second chapter. Um, the one on the roof is in the first one. So it's, got, you know, sort of spread all throughout the game. But once I realized that was the case, I did it everywhere. Sorry? Yeah? Yeah. On that point with the whole looking up, do you find that's a predominantly a third-person issue? Like, I don't know if um, that experience with, like, say, third-person or top-down games. Is it, I guess, more of a third-person people just don't want to look up, or is it more of a top of the I, I think it's predominantly first-person. I can imagine it happening in other, in other types of cameras as well. Um, it would probably happen in side-scrollers even, if stuff's along the top of the screen and your main action is sort of in front of you. Um, it's definitely most rampant in first-person games. Um, it's where, if you see examples of it online or people talking about it, they're generally talking about first-person shooter games as well. Or at least a game where the camera's kind of like roughly behind the character. So if it's obviously like above the camera, you're not going to have a problem at all. But if you're sort of looking at a perspective, your attention's kind of focused out in front of me and down. Um, maybe it just mirrors. Like when you're, even when you animate, you're taught to animate a head when it moves sideways to actually do a sort of a, a swing down. So I don't know whether that's just because it's visually pleasing or it's what people actually do when they move their heads, I don't know. Yeah, people don't look up in real life, that's a, that's a thing. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you look at the floor, look around the walls, but not these bedrooms. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
or is it also a bit of a niche market that you're looking to get into? Because you did mention that having a bit of like a niche game. Um, what it came down to was, okay, I want to build a game by myself. I've got no programming experience. What can I feasibly make? It's going to have to be an environment art driven game. That's my skill set. Um, so that genre kind of just naturally lent itself to what I wanted to make. Um, that's really all there is to it, honestly. I mean, that sort of that genre fascinated me. Um, I'd played it a little bit um, when I was younger. Um, and the idea of making a game where it was about um, taking it at your own pace and just exploring an environment as opposed to an action-centric game, um, which is all I've ever worked on. So to take a complete different approach to games than what I'm used to sound fun as well. Um, I could just focus on what I enjoy doing in a completely new kind of experience. And also was conceivably more achievable if I didn't have to create characters or animate them or do any complex code. Well, yeah, I didn't expect programming to be, um, well, as easy as it was, but it was a lot less daunting once I got into it than what I expected. Um, I mean, when, I, when I started the game, it was mostly grey box for a good year, year and a half of development, um, just doing the systems and designing the game. Um, I wanted to make sure that I could actually achieve what I was setting out to achieve before I started on the art, which I knew I could do the art, so that was not a problem. It was a case of, can I build the rest of it so I can actually do this? So yeah. Yeah, I learned fairly early on that programming wasn't as daunting as I expected. Um, I still know next to nothing about it. Like, it's still, a, you know, way above my head in a lot of areas. But I feel more confident going into my next game, whatever that may be, um, that I can probably push it a little further. Yeah? What's the typical process for designing um, a puzzle? Are you, are you starting from the story and the environment first and making sure it's going to fit? Or are you, like, thinking of a cool puzzle and then trying to put it in a world? Um, it probably depends on where I'm starting, which is an odd thing to, way to put it. But if it's a grey box level and there's nothing in there yet, then generally I'll like, okay, I need a puzzle for this area. And I'll just try and think something up, sketch down ideas and see what's appropriate. Um, some cases it might be an explicit need. So the game is tried to be um, paced so that there's not too many um, puzzles in a row and not too many like lock and keys in a row. And lock and key I mean pick up an item, take it to this place, put it in a thing, unlock something. I call that a lock and key puzzle. So I try not to have like too many of them strung together because that's just boring. Usually it's just one. So you'll finish a puzzle, it might give you a key, you'll then take that to a place, put it in a thing, and it unlocks the next puzzle. Or maybe the puzzle unlocks a key and you grab that or you find it or whatever. So I tried to pace it a bit like that and also pace it out so that you get maybe one complex puzzle then a few easy ones and a couple of lock and key things, then another complex puzzle again. So it's a bit of a flow through. So when it came to designing a puzzle, it was more of a case of what do I need for this area? Okay, I want a really difficult puzzle here. It's going to be very elaborate and complex. Is it going to use the whole room or is it going to be one little thing here? Um, on the flip side of that, maybe the room's already designed and I feel playing through it needs something else here. So then it's a case of, well, what's already in the environment that I can sort of design it to fit um, rather than coming up with it first. Or perhaps um, when I've designed a puzzle, I find that, okay, it's done, it's interesting, but now I've got ideas of how I could change that. So I'll take the same puzzle and then I'll make some changes to it and put it as a new puzzle. And I was pretty determined in the game not to have any puzzle be the same. Uh, there's a couple of like, little hidden like, pick-up boxes where you just kind of, like, sort out a little turn picture. That's, I don't consider that really a puzzle, it's more of an unlock a box. But uh, for the main puzzles, I wanted them to all be unique. So if I ever reused a puzzle archetype, I suppose, I tried to make sure that it was different enough or had some unique twist on it um, that, that it was distinct from its earlier version. So even if you recognize that, oh, this is the same sort of puzzle, it's still different. And so you might take what you've learned from the previous one and adapt it to that. And so therefore, it can be more complex, um, but in a way that you've already got some prior knowledge to help you out. Whereas if it was just that complex to start with, it might be too difficult. Yeah. Yes? Did you have a question? I thought someone had a question. No? No? no. Yeah? I'm just curious about your thought process and decision to go with a fixed camera versus an FPS. And was there any point in the game where you thought that it could go into that? Um, it would have made some things easier. But the reason I chose to do it was simply one of our logistics. Um, 
being doing it by myself and having no programming experience, I wanted to simplify systems as much as possible. So if I could just fix the camera in one spot and not have them walk around, then I didn't have to worry about collision with objects around the room. I didn't have to worry about designing the space for people to walk around. Um, I didn't have to worry about how am I going to focus on puzzles. And it was just it just felt easier to design that way. Um, I've caught some negative feedback for it. Um, people, I probably I'm not probably I'm probably not clear enough about that's the way it plays in the description. It's not generally something you describe it when you're describing a game mode. Like, here's how my game is, you know, works. Um, so it's a bit hard to put that in there. Um, so some people have played it and gone, oh, it's it's you click to move. What is this? Oh, it's rubbish. Oh, refund or whatever. Or just negative review and bitch about it for a while. Um, but other people, they, most people, they get it and they go, oh, it's point and click. Oh well, and they, they keep playing. They really enjoy it. So I don't know. Some people just can't see past the movement. I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's. I guess they. Um, if I were to do another game in this genre, I'd probably make it movement. Um, people seem to prefer it that way. For some people, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, not a selling point. It's a deal breaker for them. Um, but other people don't seem to mind. But would probably prefer it to be open movement. So if I were to do a sequel, I'd probably make it full movement. And now knowing more programming, I could probably feel capable of doing it too. Yes. The uh, movement is an issue, so to have a, a fixed position to look around almost suit this kind of genre. VR I'm looking into. There's a lot of work involved in adapting this game to it. Um, you can't do camera movement in VR without making people sick, unless it's controlled by the person. So I'd have to change it so you just like, rather than zooming into a puzzle, it um, just cuts or fades. I'd have to work out how the interface is going to work whether I make it exclusive like VR controllers or allow it to be played with a, a gamepad, I'd have to redesign the UI entirely to work in VR. Um, and then there's the ex whatever extra coding requirements pop up. So there's a lot involved. Um, I'm going to look into it. Whether it happens, I don't know at this stage. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try and see what happens basically. <laughs> see how difficult it's going to be and whether it's actually worth the time involved. It's actually, yeah, it's not too bad. It's a lot of these engines just enable it, um, but yeah, as you mentioned, you do have to think about the, the UI and, and a few inertia issues with movement. But, um, but yeah, I think yeah. Uh, fortunately for this kind of game, because you are fixed a lot of time, um, that actually avoids a lot of issues that other people are having with VR. Yeah, I mean, I am, I am keen to try. I mean, people have said this to me before, and I've mm. thought about it myself, certainly. So I, I would like to do it. It's yeah. more a case of, is it feasible? Um, in terms of the effort involved and the potential return on that investment of time and money. So, yeah. So, it it may be worth it if it's if it turns out to be a simple process. If it's not, then I'll probably not do it. But I don't know. I, at this stage, I really I don't know. But it is something I want to look at. Um, there was a question down the back. I kept oh, yeah. ignoring. Just so, a yeah. quick one. You said that you had the um, game uh, gray box about a year into it. Was that? Um, a bit of both. So the um, the first level was pretty much grey boxed out, um, and then the first and second level was grey boxed out pretty thoroughly, pretty early <coughs> on. The third one was kind of blocked out in a very basic way, but didn't have most of the puzzles in there. Whereas the first two actually had all the puzzles in and working as well, yeah. just all just in box form, so you could play through it. And some of my early play tests were. Okay, play through this so I can see essentially how long is the game going to take to play through. And that's where I sort of get my early estimates of the total play length of the game. Um, and then from that I also um, then built the art on top of that, got more playtesting on that. And I think from that I then like redesigned pretty extensively the first chapter um, because it just wasn't, it wasn't working. Um, also because early on there was going to be a, a, another level which was set outside the castle. That was originally going to be the first level. Um, but it became clear that I was not going to be able to ship that game. It was too big. So I had to cut one level, and the obvious one to cut was the one with the unique art set. So it went. Some of it had already been built, and it didn't make sense for the story to begin inside the castle. It kind of needed the approach from outside. So I was like, okay, well, some of it's already built. 
I'll make the tutorial set outside, which was still an enormous amount of work. It was still a unique art set, but at least it didn't require an extensive level and lots of puzzles in it. It could be done pretty quick, and I could be very careful about how much content I put in there. So, yeah, but when I cut that first level, what was the second level then became the first level, so it needed to be completely redesigned so that it, the difficulty curve and the sort of flow on from the tutorial made sense. Because um, it, was, it was designed, it was, it, the second level was the first level I designed. So I figured by this stage, um, the player will have a basic understanding of the gameplay, so I can design assuming the player already knows how to play the game. I don't have to worry about teaching the player anything in this level. And then I can make it harder and easier from there for the other levels. Once I cut the first level, I was like, well, now I can't assume the player knows everything. I'll have to redesign it. And by that stage, I'd already done two other levels. So I was like, well, now I've got a better grasp of how the game plays and how to design it so I can redo it better anyway. So it worked out for the best. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, someone else? Yes? Uh, I haven't played it yet. Um, I've been meaning to pick it up. But just, you'd think shipping a game would give you some more free time, but it really doesn't. Um, Abduction came out... Originally it was going to come out earlier in the year, I think. And I was like, okay, I'm going to launch like a couple of months after that. It'll be fine. That won't steal any marketing from me. And then it got delayed. And they wanted to delay it pretty much to around where I wanted to launch my game. I was like, shit. So I first had to push mine forward by a few weeks, which I was not prepared for. Um, and then I shipped mine, and then like a week after I shipped mine, they delayed theirs again. I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> so at least I, I got a bit of marketing off that. Um, people were mentioning, hey, this got delayed, why don't you place one instead? So that was good. So just quickly, how long from the time we had the project to shipping, how long did you end up spending? Um, probably three years, pretty close to three years spot on actually. Um, there was, if you look back at the, my work history up there, you'll notice some overlap between work at these studios, 2004, 2014. Um, so 2013, um, Sega shut down. I started my studio. Some friends of mine also started theirs. And in 2014, I did about six to eight months work for them. And during that stage, I got almost nothing done on my project uh, because it was just, it was too much to work full time, then come home and try and work full time on my own thing among, you know, having to deal with stuff you have to deal with in life. So I had no, no free time to work on my own game. So it's close to probably two and a half years of actual production, but three years from start to ship. What was your expectation in the beginning? Like how long did you think it was? <laughs> Much <like> less. <laughs> so Much I, less. I thought it'd be maybe a year and a half. Okay. I was hoping for a year. I was expecting a really small game. That was my original idea. It was make something very small and just ship it out there. Um, I thought, okay, I don't really know how to program, so uh, there's a lot of unknowns, it's probably going to take longer than I expect, so I'm making this small game, I'll do the art in a few months, and then I'll do the code, and it might take a year, a year and a half. Um, but as I got into it and started, I guess, in designing it and in just enjoying the process of it, it kind of naturally sort of became a larger, um, grander sort of game, which was never supposed to be. Um, especially when the Kickstarter came around and I started really putting a lot of effort into making that presentable for the Kickstarter and sort of started to look really big. Um, that kind of set a sort of expectation for the rest of the game. So... Did that motivate you through the Valley of Sark? You know, that sort of moment where you get all the fun bits out of the way and then, like, here comes the tedious part and push on and just keep at it. Did that Kickstarter well, sort of energise that a lot more or did that hurt it? Well, I mean, it, it, Kickstarter helped a lot. Um, it gave me the funding I needed for a start, and it gave me a user base um, to help promote the game to and establish myself prior to launch, which without that, the game would have flopped easy, because um, you just, I, you can't launch to silence. So the Kickstarter was used to build a community and build a presence in the media um, ahead of the launch, and also supply the funding to actually finish the project. <clears throat> so, yeah. Um, I don't know, the Kickstarter was good motivation in a way, and then setting expectations then, you, have, then you then have to deliver. So I had to ship the game once the Kickstarter was done. Didn't really have a choice, well, I guess I had a choice, but I didn't feel like I had a choice. It was like people now have paid for this game, I gotta bloody deliver for them. Um, yeah, but otherwise, working on the game by myself also meant that if I'm getting sick of something, I can just do a different job. Like if I'm, if I'm getting tired of the, the programming, I'll go do the smart. If I'm getting tired of the art, I'll go do the programming again. So, yeah. That's how you 
Yeah, pretty much. This, ta this task is draining me too much. I'll go do something simple for a bit. Come back to that one. It's more of a statement, but I think um, you're a good example for, for an indie developer where scope creep is the enemy. Uh, and if you really do need to constrain things to execute. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. Scope creep was, it's probably not too much of a problem. Like I did, when I did add the, um, the, a lot of the hidden pickups and stuff, they were never in the original design, but I found the game needed them. So that was a bit of a creep. Um, uh, there was a, so there may be a little bit of creep, but mostly I think I just underestimated the workload, um, especially given that so much of it was unknown to me. Like because I'm an environment artist, I could kind of estimate the workload involved in the art. I still underestimated that, but I didn't know how to didn't know how to estimate the programming or the sound design or anything else for the workload. So that that came back to hurt me a lot. Um, so the next project will be done much more efficiently. At least I'll know what mistakes not to make and I'll make a whole new set, so yeah. yeah and I, th I think it was smart, um, playing to your strengths and, and not worrying about moving and all that stuff, which means you could focus on, on graphics and things like that. So I think that's a smart choice. A lot of indie developers have to think like that. I'll sort of keep, keep um, you know, the creative energy under control. It's very easy to get carried away with the thing. Yeah, absolutely. Oh yeah, one of my most vocal critics, um, my most, well not just vocal, but most vitriolic critic in my Steam reviews um, ripped into my game. At the time he had about 40 to 50 hours played. And you can finish, the, most people will finish the game in 20. Um, my, a friend of mine's done it in six. Like first playthrough, she found it way too easy and complained to me that it was too easy. Whereas other people were saying like, no, oh, 20 hours, good, solid, liked it, good pacing. This guy had like 50 hours and it was just, just ripping into it. And then last I checked, he was like up to 170. <laughs> and this, he's been posting on the forums like saying, oh, I'm not having fun, this is shit, why are you doing this? I'm like, geez, dude, just stop playing. <laughs> <laughs> Go find something else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yep, yep, still shit, yep. <laughs> still don't like it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> crazy. We had a thread where a guy was trying to get the best rank in every single level in our game and was posting it every single day, complaining bitterly and <laughs> abusively about the game. People were like begging with him to stop playing the game because he hated it that much. <laughs> <laughs> he just kept going. And we were like, we can't stop. Let's just let him burn himself out. And eventually he finished it and clocked it and kind of grudgingly admitted it and that he finished. And we didn't hear that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah, he's like a puzzle game or something. But, but, but it's like, on one hand, he was like the most diligent fan. On the other hand, it's like, oh, you know, if anyone saw his thread, they'd just go, what is, what is wrong with this game? Apparently, everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's, yeah. I don't have the patience for that. If I don't like a game, I just stop playing it. I haven't got time for this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, you talked a bit about the Kickstarter, but it sounds like it came on later on. How did you fund for the, uh, the um, game? The game was pretty much predominantly self-funded off my own savings. Another reason why it was done by me was because I couldn't afford to hire people. Um, so I got cheap rent a lot of the time, lived really cheap, didn't spend much money, which really sucks. I don't want to do that again. So, um, yeah, predominantly self-funded for a long time. An advantage was that I had no debts, I had no family to support or anything, so I could, I could feasibly do this, whereas a lot of people just can't do that. Um, Kickstarter came along uh, 2015, yeah, about a year ago, a little over, little over a year ago now. Um, and that was, so it was, yeah, probably two thirds through development at that stage, so it was more about, I had a good looking, fairly polished demo ready for the Kickstarter at that stage. So people, I, which helped a lot, I think, because I, because I was coming into the Kickstarter with no brand name behind me as a developer or the game, um, and also catering to a fairly niche market. Selling it was really, really hard. So having a fairly complete looking product there already so people can see the game and see it's actually a product they can invest in, I think really helped. Do you need to 
spend time like doing, say, contracting every now and then? Um, so the stint I did at Five Lives for six months during the middle um, helped. I did. I pretty much did that to top my bank account back up again so I could continue on. Um, and then the Kickstarter was sort of the same thing again. I was fairly confident at the start of the Kickstarter that if I didn't make the Kickstarter, I'd still, if I didn't meet the goal, I would still finish the game, but I'd have to strip it right back and ship something much less than what I shipped here. Um, but luckily the Kickstarter did complete and it gave me the funds to actually finish it to the extent that I actually wanted to um, do, yeah. Were there any big surprises or elevations when you were on Kickstarter? Like, about, the, about the game, I guess? Um, not, not really, I don't think so. Um, um, I learned a lot about Kickstarters um, and learned that I never want to do it again. <laughs> but no, I didn't, I didn't get that much from the game. I, I was surprised how much people took to it. I mean, maybe I just wasn't confident enough in it when I went in. I, just, I was really, not pessimistic, but I wasn't confident that I'd make the goal. I felt like um, it's too niche an audience. Um, do people really want to back a little exploratory puzzle game? Um, turns out they did. Turns out there's a really active community that loves this sort of stuff. And when I did my Kickstarter, like another Kickstarter came out almost the exact same time with a very similar game, um, almost the exact same genre. Um, probably even closer to Myst than mine was. And I was, I was very heavily leveraging Myst as a name name drop during my Kickstarter, because again I had no brand name behind me. So it was like, how can I draw in people from other, you know, with other name association? Um, so I use that a lot during the Kickstarter, and then since then I've pretty much tried to distance myself from it. To, so I'm not comparing myself to some other game anymore. I'm trying to say, here's my game; it stands on its own. Um, but yeah, okay, diverging, uh, digressing a bit there. But uh, yeah, another game came out at the same time, doing a very similar genre. So I almost started competing with them, which was kind of annoying. Um, but it shows that I mean, they, we both got funded, and yeah. And then Abduction launched like the same time as my game, or about a month or so later. And I think another one launched a little earlier than mine, which I didn't even know about. So apparently, the, this market is still is still vibrant, um, small, but it's it's yeah active. You do yeah. more market research the next time, yeah. <laughs> well, I did I did do some before this one. Like it wasn't just like what can I achieve? Okay, I'll do that. It was like all right, what can I achieve? Okay, let's look into this and see if people actually buy these sort of games. And I had a look and tried to find what was out there and how much they're selling and that sort of stuff. And it seemed like they weren't doing huge numbers, but I'm like, okay, well, I'm one person. I only have to pay one person's wage. I don't need to sell a million copies. Um, so I was like, those numbers are fine. If I sell that, I'm set. So I didn't expect to sell like the big name ones, but yeah. yeah. So yeah, but um, yeah, before I do any project, I would, I would do some market research and find out whether it's actually viable. Um, I'll be doing that next time as well, whatever it is, yeah. What platforms did you target? It's on PC and Mac at the moment, and I will be doing an iOS port at some stage in the future. It's about the smallest profile you're playing the game with? Um, smallest profile? Yeah, so it'll be on iPhone and iPad. Oh, okay. Um, Presumably, it, I, it should work on iPhone. I mean, I, I'll have to redesign how some of the hidden pickups um, work because they'll just be too small to catch the little clues on a small screen. But it'll certainly work on an iPad. Um, theoretically, it should work on the iPhone if I just you know, adjust the design enough. Or you have to design some of the interface anyway, so it's not a big deal. Um, might do Android. That's, that's a bit of a question. Um, it's a premium game, and my understanding of premium games on Android is that they just get pirated and don't sell and you have to support a bajillion different devices that don't work properly. So I, it's probably not worth doing, but we'll see how well the Apple One sells. If it sells particularly well, then it might be worth going to Android as well. Um, won't be doing console, because consoles are just a nightmare, from what I've been told anyway. <laughs> yes? And you mentioned like, uh, you launched your Kickstarter. It's, you're pretty much a new company, and you launched your first game. What would you say were your main most of my pledges came through 
either the Kickstarter site itself, which implies people found it through just the discovery sort of thing, um, or through Facebook, okay. which suggests that the either the advertising or the shares that I was doing on there or getting people sharing it around. I did a little bit of advertising on, on Facebook. I didn't. I don't think that really amounted to much. I really don't know. Oh, it's still something. So did you get advertising mm. through Facebook or just your page, the likes and everything? Well, I had the page as well, and I had like all my friends and everything were sharing it around, yeah. and I was encouraging people. My back is in my Kickstarter. I want to do an update. I'd suggest you know share the link around. So, almost or like the, the direct Facebook page and fa uh, direct Facebook and direct direct Kickstarter page were my two biggest sources, and I got a little bit from external sources. I got almost zero coverage in the media uh, yeah. because no one's interested in covering a Kickstarter for like some no-name developer and no-name brand. I did get coverage on a lot of adventure game sites, so the actual genre-specific sites were keen to cover it. So I got a bit of traffic and tension through there, which is great. Yeah, so like sites like you know, Ad Adventure Gamers or something like that, or yeah. Just Adventure, they specific to that audience um, covered it because you know that audience is excited about new games coming up in that genre. So yeah, and being a niche genre, they're starved for content. Well, not starved for content, but there's easy to take up anything in that genre. So, so they wrote about your game on their site or just the link? No, they wrote about some of them just linked to it. Some of them actually wrote up articles saying, "Hey, check out this Kickstarter. It looked good. Whatever, go have a look." Uh, in general, I contacted them. They just mass email, well, not mass. I uniquely addressed and and wrote it to everyone, but um, is basically find as many as I could and just email them. That was during the campaign, right, or before? Uh, during. I probably should have done it before. Um, in hindsight, I would have promoted the Kickstarter more prior to the launch, um, and I think it would have to get people hyped. Uh, it, you're seeing it more and more now as well. People trying to get people hyped about a Kickstarter before it launches, so that when it does, they get a big hit on day one, yeah. which pushes up the rankings and hopefully gets the attention of Kickstarter, so they put a little Kickstarter we like thing on it and gets featured and that sort of stuff. Um, I didn't really do any of that, and I think that hurt me. Um, so I had to just promote it from, I did it like maybe maybe a week before I started um, announcing it and saying, hey, it's coming now, it's, you know, check out some screenshots or whatever, and I got a little bit of attention, but not much, so. It would have been better to build up and establish user base before I launched it. Yeah, good, maybe a month, maybe two, I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember when, uh, before the game launched, we did this thing called Thunderclap. Yeah. How did that go? Um, I actually don't know what impact that had. Oh. I, was, I didn't really have a way to track it. I didn't really know what it was going to do. It was more of a, an afterthought, because I did it really late, and I didn't think that I'd be able to get enough supporters for that. that. Thunderclap, if you don't know, it's kind of a social media spam site, essentially. <laughs> um, you write a post, and you provide a link to whatever it is you're advertising, and then you try and encourage people to click on the, the share button, essentially. And it, what it does is just, it, on the date you set, everyone that supports it, they, you know, it has their feed post that post that you've written. So you rewrite, the, you pre-write a post and their feed will then share it under their name. So the idea is to spread around as many friends as possible in one big hit. Maybe you know, try and get a Twitter hashtag trending or something, that sort of stuff. So I had people sharing around on Facebook and Twitter, and I, I, I scheduled it for um, about eight, 10 hours after launch. So it launched late, um, maybe about eight o'clock at night here in Australia, but it was meant to hit peak hours in the US. And the thunderclap was meant to go off um, early morning, early next morning in Australia to hit the Australian market. Since it was mostly my friends doing it, I wanted to hit you know, the local um, area. Uh, whether it had an impact, I don't really know. I think, I suspect it was just a pair of spam on people's feeds with everyone getting the same posts from everyone. People probably just went, what is this? Um, and ignored it. So I, I honestly don't know whether it had a positive or negative effect. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't need to because one of my backers was doing that already. Not not the gorilla thing, but it was, he was he was already on all those boards because he loved those sort of games and he was posting about my Kickstarter and then about my game. I say he's trashing like Mist and the 
Right. Wasn't wasn't trashing it, but he was he was basically promoting, posting in support of my game, on these other boards that he went frequented, like on the official miss boards and other places as well. And saying, hey, check out this game. It's really cool. I've been playing it on my back. You should go and play it. So. Yeah. <laughs> he was my biggest backer too. He spent he he pledged a lot for it. That's the question I'm trying to try to answer myself right now. Um, on one hand, I could leverage my existing technology and make a sequel, or at least a game in the same genre, which I could then turn out a lot faster. That's probably the financially safe option. Um, it's probably the least interesting option to me as well. After three years of working on this, I kind of want to do something different. Um, what that is, I don't know. <laughs> I'm still really busy with this one at this point. I'm just preparing to put out another um, patch soon. I've got to prepare for packs at the end of the year. I still got to complete most of my Kickstarter uh, backer rewards and ship them out. And I got to start work on the iOS port as well. So there's so much work to do on this one that even starting the next project is months away at least at this point. But I am thinking about it and I'm trying to like think about things I've enjoyed in the past or what I like, might like to experiment with. And I've been playing a few games recently, that, some just to catch up on games I've never played, um, and others to play games I've enjoyed in the past to see what is it I liked about these games and would I like to do something similar or use some of these similar mechanics in a game, that sort of stuff. So yeah, I'm thinking about it, but no plans at this stage. And is there just like a major thing that like you would have done differently for your strategy of um, developing the game? Just on I would not have done it by myself. That is the big thing. Um, whether I do it by myself next time will depend on money, really. Um, whether I can afford to hire another person or not. Um, it's, the reason I did it by myself was because I had, couldn't hire someone. In hindsight, I probably should have teamed up with someone. Um, I may look at doing that for the next one. Maybe another small studio that needs more people. We could do something together instead of just you know, collaborate. So, I don't know. But yeah, that, that would be the big thing. It's a lot of work doing it by yourself. I don't recommend that. I did it almost just to see if I could. And also to see if, well, to get experience in other departments that I had no experience in. So now I've, I couldn't be a programmer. But at least now if I'm working in a team with programmers, I can communicate better with them and I can understand a code problem when I see it now, or at least better than I could before. It's like, it's broken. Why is it broken? I don't know what, why is it broken. So now I can at least, you know, I can dig into it myself and, I don't know, help. Or make things worse, I don't know. <laughs> but, yeah. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. Um, are you going to stay around and answer some more questions? Sure. Might oh. get a beer. That was a great talk. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, um... I'm going to be giving a very similar talk to this down at GCAP at the end of the year. Um, so this is in some ways is a kind of trial run for that. So if you have any feedback about what you liked or didn't like, please let me know. Because, um, yeah, well, yeah, get the lighting working first, yeah. Um, this already it was a long, much longer version than what the GCAP one's going to be, because it's a much shorter time frame, so I have to cut it down a bit. So if you, if you want to let me know what parts you like, when we're chatting around, um, what parts you've enjoyed the most and what you didn't, so I can kind of refine it, that'd be great too. All right. Thanks, Thanks.